Νομίζω μπορούμε να ξεκινήσουμε και να πω καταρχήν ότι είναι χαρά μας που έχουμε σήμερα κοντά μας τον ε, κύριο Γιώργο Σιβίλογλου, ο οποίος μας επισκέπτεται από το μακρινό Σεντζεν της Κίνας, έφτασε στην Κρήτη, αν δεν κάνω λάθος, δύο μέρες πριν, ε, πρώτη φορά στην Κρήτη και πρώτη φορά στο Πολυτεχνείο Κρήτης. Οπότε είναι χαρά μας να το φιλοξενούμε, να πούμε δύο λόγια για το βιογραφικό του. Έχει τελειώσει ηλεκτρολόγος μηχανικός στο Εθνικό Μητσοβείο Πολυτεχνείο πριν κάποια χρόνια και κατόπιν ε, ε, βρέθηκε στο University of Central Florida, όπου έκανε το διδακτορικό του στην περιοχή των Photonics. Ε, κατόπιν ακολούθησε ε, μια πορεία σε θέσεις με το διδακτορικό ερευνητή, πρώτα ε, στο Amsterdam ως Marie Curie Fellow και κατόπιν στο MIT και ή μάλλον από τα είπα, πρώτα στο Μαϊντή και κατόπιν στο Άμστερνταμ και τώρα βρίσκεται λοιπόν στο Southern University of Science and Technology στο Σιντζέν, όπου διευθύνει το εργαστήριο, ε, ξεχνά πώς λέγεται, Ultra Cold Athens. Μάλιστα και θα μας μιλήσει λοιπόν σήμερα για το θέμα της ομιλίας Engineering Ultra Cold Quantum Matter, θα δούμε λοιπόν πώς Κάποιε τεχνολογίε μπορούν να χρησιμοποιηθούν και να αξιοποιηθούν για να έχουμε ειδικού τύπου μικροσκόπια. Κάποιοι ασχολούνται με αυτό το τομέα και είμαι σίγουρο ότι θα βρουν πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα την ομιλία. Ευχαριστούμε λοιπόν πολύ κύριε Σεβίλο που είστε εδώ σήμερα. Αναμένουμε λοιπόν να σα ακούσουμε. Σα ευχαριστώ. Το talk will be in English. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to give my first talk. Uh, ever in a Greek university since I finished my studies here in Hania. So I will be discussing about engineering what are called quantum matter. And uh, now this is pretty much a short biography. First of all, Abutakis already said uh, some of his speeches. I have done my PhD with Christodoulidis in Creo in photonics and I hope also work with Professor Stegemann with the late Professor Stegemann, and since then I switched from photonics to towards quantum matter and quantum materials, and I have done a postdoc with uh, Kessel, he's a Nobel Prize winner for doing a PhD uh, in atomic physics. And then I was a Marine Curie Fellow at the University of Amsterdam with Professor Schreck, but he's the pioneer, the first to condensate uh, strontium atoms and at the University of Amsterdam. And since 2018, I'm faculty in SASTEC, kind of similar to our uh, Vasmida B researcher, and on tenure track. So these are some of my research highlights. Initially, I have worked with, uh, in photonics, and I was working with self-bending eddy beams. It's a type of wave packet that I will discuss more later. And then in the last year of my PhD, I have worked in passive PD symmetry. This is one of the field has been recognized by Nature Physics as one of the 10 breakthroughs of the decade. And in, uh, at MIT and in Amsterdam, I have worked with quantum materials in atomic physics. So we have realized for the first time in an atomic system, the so-called Hofstadter Hamiltonian. As I will tell you, this is very much related with electrical engineering, and also we have built a lab and we have done precision measurements on a quantum gas experiment of strontium. So this is Sergen, 40 years ago, like the age of our university, of the university here, it was a fish city, as they say, of 30,000 people, and as you see a crazy exponential decay, up to 12 or 13 million nowadays. This is at the southernmost part of uh, China. It's at the border with Hong Kong, because you just take a train and you go in 10 minutes to Hong Kong. And it's the headquarters of Huawei is in Shenzhen. I have read and that 90% of world's computer parts are being made in Shenzhen. So everyone has a phone, possibly some of it but has been assembled in Shenzhen. So this is uh, the university that I'm working now. This is the library. It's a university that was just established in 2011, and we started having PhD students only this year. 
and already because of the people that have hired, is a top 10 university in Sana. Last year it was 13, and now it's already uh, eight, and has uh, gone beyond much more established universities. So I will be starting first with uh, kind of the highlight or the focus of my PhD. So we know that from ancient times that life likes and wants to move on straight lines. But what we have demonstrated is that you can create optical beams or optical wave packets that at the same time do not diffract quickly and they move on parabolic trajectories. <coughs> so this is a theory or simulation, but we have done an experiment, as you can see here, pretty much we have created the profile of this beam and the experiment and theory are matching each other very well and we have tried to observe the peculiar properties of these beams. What we have seen is that we can control, pretty much engineer the phase of this wave packet or this, this optical beam and make it move on parabolic trajectories. This is like a no fit uh, lines, so this is experimental data where we see by controlling, like doing Fourier synthesis, we can create this beam that they can stay undistorted and at the same time move on this type of trajectories. And this has uh, several advantages and people have followed this type of work. Is, and as I will show you, it has some properties like this. First of all, you can generate it not only in one dimension, but in two dimensions. This is an experimental picture. And this is one of the properties of these beams. What happens is that you can truncate one part of this beam and it can self-heal. Pretty much you can put it in scattering media, you can put it in smoke, and you will see that it can pretty much regenerate itself and end up being like this. So this is kind of quite powerful if you want to imagine biological samples or other type of materials. And some of these properties of course, have been highlighted in nature, in physics, we had a paper in science, and this we have worked in nonlinear optics and things like that. And people have followed our work. We can see, for example, you can use it in micro microparticle manipulation, you can sort small and big particles. It has been used in early plasmons, pretty much using this wave packet to create nano trajectories or micro trajectories that are not straight lines. It goes beyond uh, photonics where every time that you can have a wave system, for example in electrons, they have created this type of wave packets and they do not disperse, they do not diffract with uh, propagation of evolution. And the most exciting thing that uh, I have heard about these beams is last year my PhD advisor sent me a message, have you seen this? I say no. So already there is a microscope that they sell it commercially by the company M Squared. This company was uh, focused on tie sapphire lasers, but now they go to microscopes and this is real data. And if we have the patent, we haven't gotten any money from this patent, but kind of establishing what is the diffraction free, the configuration to create these beams. And this is from their website. And as you see, with this type of beams, you can achieve some pretty spectacular things just by doing beam engineering. You can have subcellular or micrometer, uh, micrometer resolution. You can have a big field of view. And what I find impressive is that you can, they say that they can compete and be 500 times faster than confocal microscopy. So this is something that uh, in engineering department this could be interesting and you can extend it to do quantum particle imaging you can do biological particles so it's as you see here i think this is uh, neurons i'm not so sure so i will first start with the, the last part before starting my own team this when i worked at the strontium microscope team in amsterdam i was a Marie Curie fellow there this is my host, Professor Florian Zweig, and this is the team that I was kind of uh, co-leading with uh, Florian, <coughs> and I will be discussing about this. So, some of the applications that this type of project that I will be discussing today they have is uh, uh, realized here. 
For example, I do not know about if you know about optical lattice clocks. Pretty much, you are using an atomic transition. You shine light on atoms, and then this transition can be very narrow, maybe in the order of hertz, or as I will show you, it can be even millihertz. And these type of transitions have been exploited by NIST and by by PTB and many labs in the world to create the most accurate uh, clocks. Pretty much, this is uh, the state of the art in the field. Another thing that has been proposed, and now there are several groups that are trying to create this, following early proposals by Peter Zoller and Ignacio Sirac, is to do quantum information and quantum computing with atomic physics. This is one of the platforms that is uh, kind of uh, is quite strong, because every atom is the same with any other atom in the universe. So pretty much you can create uh, a universally appealing uh, quantum gate. So this is more specific. If you see here how optical clocks have evolved over the years from the 50s, we have this type of accuracy, 10 to the minus 10, and already we have reached to 10 to the minus 20. And this is kind of when the optical clock starts playing an optical frequency clock that they led to the Nobel Prize in 2005. And uh, you see my, the group of Florian Schreck is uh, the coordinator in one of the quantum flagship consortium. It's called IQ Clock. You saw Europe is giving 1 billion euros for the next 10 years to promote quantum science. And creating integrated quantum cl uh, optical clocks is one of the winning proposals. Another idea related with engineering, electrical engineering, is a, like to create programmable quantum simulators. So pretty much putting atoms, holding them with optical tweezers, and then create the whole system of loading, averaging, and pretty much registering in the memory, doing error corrections. And with this motivation, I want to go to the more technical part of my talk. So. If you do not know what is the uh, Bose Einstein condensation, of course the name says many things, like Bose and Einstein kind of collaborate or they work together to show that uh, particles can have the tendency to uh, stick together, and this can be shown here. Pretty much much of the world that we are living or we are observing is in the classical regime. We have atoms or molecules of oxygen, and when they are very hot, they can just behave like billiard balls, like in state trajectories. But when you start going to the quantum, in the quantum regime, when the densities become bigger, or the temperature becomes much, much lower, you can go to another system where the matter-wave uh, duality starts appearing, and pretty much instead of having classical particles, you can have one big macro-atom. And this is what we can see. This led to the Nobel Prize. One of them was my postdoc uh, advisor in 2001. And this is, you can think of it as a, what is laser beam for light. It can be kind of a matter wave uh, for atoms. So this is exactly how it looks. You can, you can just have atoms take photos. They absorb some of the light. And whenever they become denser or colder, you can see this type of pictures. I will explain more how these things work and how they can explain our results. So, why do we need low temperatures? So, whenever you have low temperatures, the disorder is smaller. Or you cannot see, for hot atoms, if you want to put atoms in a periodic structure like this, you can have very big fluctuations. And this can introduce big uh, variation in any measurement you do. While if you cool them down in the lowest vibrational state, you can have hot atoms like this and everything becomes easier to image, easier to characterize. Just to give you a scale, so if we want to achieve or to study similar physics with the physics that we are studying in a metal, for example, to do super exchange physics, we have to go to 10,000 Kelvin, or anything below 10,000 Kelvin is, can be already ordered. But if you want to achieve the same thing with cold atoms, 
because of the much lower densities, like 10 orders of magnitude lower densities, or you have to go to similar orders of magnitude lower rate temperatures. So this sometimes you see ultra cold atoms because they are so dilute, so you need much, much cold temperature, much colder temperature. And in order to get these temperatures to go from 500 Cel uh, Celsius to minus 273, you have to do several steps. So this is the experiment that I, I have designed and I learned uh, uh, from Scott in Amsterdam as a Marie Curie Fellow. And I uh, just want to say that most of the atoms that have been brought to the general, to quantum the general, they are shown here, this is the first column, rubidium was the first one. Now we go here with strontium, it has two electrons in the outer cell, and this creates some opportunities. For example, one is related in the, and is shown in the atom clocks. So strontium looks like this. It has two transitions, and one of them, and it has also a transition from the ground state here to the excited state. And this is being used to make, for example, a three-dimensional optical lattice clock with the accuracy of 10 to the minus 19 already. This is kind of the world record team. So they are using exactly the same atom. And uh, this is the lab that, uh, one part of the lab that I built with uh, two students. So this is how everything was looking at the beginning. And this is how it ended up being. It's kind of, uh, I was, even if I sit now, I'll say it's quite impressive. So, and uh, I will describe a little bit of the techniques. I will be quite fast about this. So you start with a gas, with a piece of, a chunk of metal, and you heat it up to 500 Celsius. So now it's separated, kind of evaporates, let's say, or you create a vapor, and it starts moving in the system, and you have to develop several techniques to go from 500 meters per second, this is a fluorescence from the atomic beam that we have created, that you go here and trap it in 10 to the minus 11 uh, millibars and go down to a few millimeters per second. So it's several orders of magnitude cooling as you have to use lasers to achieve this. So these are the three steps. I'm going to skip many of the details. So I just want to say that we go from hundreds of Kelvin to millikelvin with the blue light, the 461. Then we will pass to another, that will reduce the temperature to another three orders of magnitude, and then we'll use another dipole trap loading to go to BAC. And uh, this is pretty much, uh, if you're familiar with some of the atomic structure, we're using these two transitions. This is one very efficient cooling, and it's used for imaging. And this is to, to imaging very precise at the micro Kelvin temperatures. So what you have here is just a magnetic field, light, and atoms in vacuum. So some of these things are very interesting to train uh, students. So this is one of our setups. This is the, all these are kind of homemade lasers with a small, with a, the setups, also magnetic coils, we are in a regime of uh, 1,000 Gauss or a little bit less, or not too high magnetic field, because you have to use these to magnetically trap the atoms. So this is how, this is a photo just from my phone, it's like the mod, the magnetoptical trapping, we can trap maybe 10 to the 8, so this is maybe 10 to the 6, but you can trap much more atoms in this type of temperature. So pretty much you see a, a ball of uh, light because atoms are suspended here or held together by laser beams. This is the next step. It cools the atom even more. And you'll see now we will have to use a kind of uh, imaging to see that these are the atoms in trap. These are maybe in the order of 100,000 atoms, and we will let them down, they start expanding, and you see, we will take a picture, and this you can characterize pretty much the temperature. This is the other setup. And I want to tell you that this is now 
So in normal matter, we have 10 to the 23 per few grams. So now we are talking about maybe 10 to the 5 atoms. So already we started being to very dilute system. So that we call them ultra cold, ultra dilute uh, gases. And the tendency of the field is to go to even to individual atoms and start seeing the phenomena there. And next step is you load atom to a dipole trap. You have usually a 1064 laser. And what you can see is that you put the atom here you, with two cross dipole traps and here you can have maybe the order of one million atoms and you can see them with a microscope and one of the goals is to see the individual atoms so this is the experiment this is you go from a thermal gas to a quantum degenerate uh, Bose-Einstein condensate you see that the shape changes this is the all the gases that we have, that we have a pipe, the gas comes out in this, in this regime but when the particles start uh, showing their quantum nature you have a very, even to the eye, very different behavior so this is of course what I have shown so this lab, you start from here and you end up here and this can be a few micrometers, like 30 micrometers is where all the science happens in this uh, several cubic meter experiment and uh, this is exactly how it looks you trap it here you let it fall and it expands and all these properties uh, so for example this property that you can create coherent matter waves is being used in interferometry and because then the light is uh, the matter is very pure pretty much all these atoms belong in one quantum state and the lifetime of this can be like seven seconds. So pretty much you have a very pure quantum state that has this type of lifetimes. So this is last year. So we were pretty much the only group in Europe, our team, that had this type of uh, quantum gases. And now already in 2019 there are two groups in China, maybe one group in, more in Europe several more groups in the world, so this type of experiment was kind of pretty much uh, quite unique. So this is what I want to discuss as first step. So the 698 transition in strontium is the one that is used now to define uh, time. Pretty much how often you go up down here can lead to the definition of temperature. While what we have studied is another transition here that has very similar properties and on top of this it's magnetic so it can create ultra sensitive magnetometer I will explain how this can be related with this application so this is uh, the data from the international consortium how you define units and two of these are related with the work that we are doing so if you see here the current definition of time is defined with one transition between a hyperfine transition and cesium and this has to do with this, I'm not going to go to the details, pretty much how many times uh, one atom changes state or what well, is given this so and the other part more related with electrical engineering is if I ask you what is the definition of resistance Maybe very soon you have to think about this von Clausius constant that def is defining resistance based on two fundamental constants the Planck constant and the electron charge and uh, as I said, the definition of the time is this a duration of these many periods of the radiation corresponding in a transition season but this will be about to change and have maybe several orders of magnitude improvement in the precision and this already, maybe this started in 10 to the 12 now we are in 10 to the 19 in strontium so strontium is a proposed new standard of time so as I said this is a miniature transition we have uh, like optical lasers and we made a cavity to be able to lock the laser very precisely to study this type of uh, 
doubly forbidden transition, it is a clock transition, and this transition nobody has measured as precisely as we didn't with uh, laser radiation. You can have millisecond transitions, pretty much you can have very, very long lifetime, you can create very stable clocks or other devices. The rest uh, is not so relevant for now. So this is, we made one setup. First we have to create all the atoms as I showed in this big table, and then we have other optical tables to create, to have the laser lock into a cavity and to be quite narrow, not super narrow, but and good enough to probe. So we shine light on atoms, and if it is absorbed, we say, oh, now we observe the transition, and this type will be used to do whatever devices you want. So exactly this is what happened. So we shine light that is trapped in optical dipole traps, and whenever the light hits the transition, makes the atoms very hot, and pretty much you can end up losing them. And this is exactly what we did. So this is megahertz uh, line width, but in principle, if we have better laser, we can go to much narrower, uh, much narrower features here. And we have cooled the sample more, and what we have seen, we can have, this is a very narrow transition, it can be in principle millihertz, and this is referred to an iodine standard, pretty much is like the fingerprint. You know where is iodine because they have studied, they have it in books and in databases, and then you know from the distance between this and this, you know precisely where is this. And you can use it for magnetometers, you can use it to do exotic physics, and this is what we're kind of we reported this year. And uh, I want to take a minute to discuss how you can use this type of transition to make devices for ultra-sensitive magnetometry with non-magnetic strontium. So, usually a typical value is for a video, for example, if you have like 6 megahertz transitions. And if you just uh, apply a magnetic field in the order of 1 megahertz of 1 gauss, you can shift from here to here, like 1 megahertz. But when you have a much, much narrower transition, like a millihertz transition, any tiny variation of the magnetic field will be strong enough to take you out of the transition. And this is pretty much only with, without a, um, using any quantum weak measurement, you can go from milligauss to hundreds of femtogauss just by the fact that we have a very, very narrow transition available and we know it. So, this is... Uh, in order to study this, you can study with uh, conventional uh, imaging methods, but you really want to study individual atoms that are separated only by 500 nanometers with a microscope that is separated by 20 millimeters. So for this, I have designed a microscope objective. So what is a quantum gas microscope? Pretty much you want to, to image individual atoms. They have to be very close. And this is and with high fidelity. This is like two atoms that they are fluorescing and they are separated by 530 nanometers. And if you have a good resolution, you can see it. So this is the Harvard group work. So we set up to do a similar microscope, but with other techniques. Because at Harvard, the atoms are very, very close to the glass, maybe a few hundred micrometers, but we want to be like 20 millimeters away. So this is like classical optics work, so this is like we started with an objective, so we designed it, we made it, and uh, we characterized it, so this is exactly how it looks, so it has a very small depth of focus, and it's easy to display, so you see this is now uh, light, is passing through nano holes of 200 nanometers, and you see that we have pretty much very bright and quite symmetric uh, focus. And this is uh, exactly what will be good enough to resolve uh, individual atoms because the fluorescence of strontium is quite strong. So this is exactly how the A function looks, or the A spot. We have a 640 nanometer resolution. And for microscopes that they have so, such a long distance, People have paid in any labs Leica 
hundreds of, uh, maybe almost one hundred thousand dollars to make this or something. And I will design me and one master student, Nico, and uh, we'll have it in Optics Express, and now we can use it for all this wavelength. So this is a microscope object from our card drawing. This is like based on a meniscus. It has several lenses. Uh, we said it has quite good performance in a range from uh, 461 up to 671. So pretty much you can ha have um, relatively broad light. So and now this is some preliminary is also you put uh, quantum particles, you put cold atoms. And you can see that this we estimate to be less than 10 atoms. And the goal is to go have individual atoms to bring them together and kind of study quantum gates. This is the work in Amsterdam. And this is also related with uh, some of the stuff of the work that I proposed to do in China. So this is a proposal of Peter Zoller. You can do quantum computing with cold trapped ions. So Trapped ions usually they were far away, but nowadays the technology of atoms is very much, quite mature. So pretty much you can address individual atoms and make gates and make them interact in this type of proposals. So as you maybe know, optical tweezers gave the Nobel Prize to Arthur Askin for creating them for the optical tweezers and the application to biological systems. So what was one of my ideas is to follow this path with the uh, exotic atom and do like three-dimensional atomic arrays to do programmable quantum simulator so pretty much do the first steps to do neutral atoms and manipulate it using what you can do in this type of um, arbitrary geometry so you see here this kind of uh, setup that we are trying to follow these are atoms, you sign light, you can address them individually, and you can start building this with smaller setups, like do optical tweezers, develop all the techniques, do imaging, start seeing the fluorescence, and the next steps you can go to start adding the atomic system. So I will skip this. So there is a proposal, and we are developing uh, together with my students other ideas how to do quantum computing with uh, magnetically interacting atoms. So you have to move them. Some of these things can be initially in nanophotonics, and then you can take it towards quantum computing, depending on how you go. So this is a small team. I went last year, so this is a PhD and a research assistant. And some of the other things that I would try to do, depending on how things go, is to do, of course, quantum computing, try to do quantum imaging, make uh, two paths of to do entangled photons, and try to, to see correlations do optical tweezers and do like hybrid systems. I to go to back to nanophotonics and combine it with atoms, start to buy nanophotons that is easier to set up and quicker to have output. So, okay. so this is, I'll go now to the work that I have done at uh, MIT. This is related with um, the definition of resistance. So this is our lab, this is the lasers, this is the atoms, so you see this lab is a little bit messier. So, so now in electrical engineering, so is it possible to have room temperature supercon superconductors? And superconductors can be beneficial for many, many things besides uh, transporting power. So it can be used to magnetic levitation, as I will show in the next slide. So uh, I have a connection in 1911. A Dutch scientist found for the first time superconductors, and everything went kind of smooth till 1986, where people discovered here the high temperature superconductors, and they gave them the Nobel Prize immediately after one year. And, but these physics have not been uh, understood completely yet, so it is kind of the field of cold atoms trying to say something about it. So maybe you know about this, so there is a magnetic levitation train in Shanghai besides uh, uh, Japan. So this is the airport, and I have just read uh, a few days ago 
that China wants to lay tracks for 1,000 kilometers per hour maglev train. China already has the biggest train network in the world, maybe equal to the whole of the world, and they say that they are planning to put 2,000 kilometer lines to connect two cities, and this can happen in two hours. So already I have taken the fast, there is crazy development in the fast trains. So also from the point of view of understanding nature, you can study with cold atoms this type of systems to understand how superconductors are working, but you have to pass from different uh, phases. I will discuss a little bit about this phase. People have already been here, and here is possibly where superconductor physics is happening. So this is related with some of the ideas of uh, Feynman that said, oh, if you want to study a system like a high temperature superconductor, it's very hard to study the 10 to the 23 atoms and write equations and solve it. So what uh, the field of quantum simulation says is <coughs> you have an intractable quantum system, you create a Hamiltonian to understand it, and then go have a clean system. This system can be nanophotonics, can be atomic physics, and then learn something from this Hamiltonian with a simpler system, and then understand a much more impactful, let's say, physical material. So, so there's a lot of work, so like vortices, the graphene, for example, has been studied also with cold atoms, antiferromagnetic ordering, and this is one of the things that we have studied at MIT, kind of to make strong magnetic fields. And this is related with uh, the following thing. But before going to this, I want to say a few words. I don't know. So this is, a, let's say, a standard, almost theoretical equation in a, like the post hubbard model. But there are several terms, like this, is related with atom moving from one side and going to the other, like quantum tunneling. And this is a term of like trapping atoms, and this is another term that has to do with the interaction of uh, atoms with each other. So this I will just try to explain. You put the atoms in optical lattices, this is created by making standing waves, pretty much you have to know all the things about uh, wave propagation and wave interference, you can create coherent and incoherent lattices. This is 1D up to 3D. And this is uh, our perspective on quantum tunneling. This is an experiment from Harvard, from the Griner group. So pretty much they put uh, a line of atoms, they let them move in uh, periodic potential, and if you know the quantum wall, the atoms will tend to end up going left, right, depending on the probability density. But if you take the density average, you can see this kind of ballistic expansion of electrons. Pretty much without uh, diffusion, you can see uh, atoms expanding. This is completely quantum. You can have interactions that play an important role. So when there are no interactions and you have a wave packet, it will start spreading. But when you add attractive interactions, you can make the atoms contract or they can make them repel each other and blow out. So all these phenomena can be readily seen in our labs and they play important roles in atomic clocks and uh, interferometry, etc. So people that are more familiar with uh, light, so if you have incoherent light, you have several beams, you let them interfere, you will know that it will just make a big uh, beam. This is what will happen. But if you have coherent light, you have laser, you pass it through a grating, you have this type of interference pattern. And these very similar phenomena appear in quantum optics, in atomic physics, and of course in classical optics. So you can see things like that. I will not discuss this now. So, but if you see from a perspective of microscope, you can start seeing individual atoms you can see here that you can have very big density fluctuations. This is an experiment from Munich. While the, if you have a very nice, very pure state, these are individual atoms, as you can see them one by one, and how flat they are and how small fluctuations you have. 
So we are going now to one part of my talk about the Hofstadter butterfly. Maybe you have seen this in movies and comedy shows and uh, kind of this is kind of a famous picture. But what is the whole point of this? What does it tell us about nature? What does it tell us about technology? So this was used to study the energy level and the wave function of block electrons under the action of the magnetic field. So, and as I will say, this is very related with many phenomena. So, on this axis, the Hof of the Hofstadter butterfly will have the size of the lattice, of the atomic lattice, and this is the magnetic field. And this is the energy, pretty much the energy spectrum. All the physics that we are usually discussing happens here. We have very low magnetic field, even if the field is a few tesla, or even 10 tesla, or 100 tesla, everything happens here. But what uh, our experiment has enabled us to do in atomic physics is to start exploring all this, to go from 1% of this, from 0.001, to start going here. And then you can see not only very full math, but you can study the integer quantum Hall effect, the rank points, all these type of things. We have done work on this, and I will discuss more. So, now we go back to this. If you want to understand what the resistance is and to make a new standard of resistance, you have to understand this. And this is very much related with the work that I am discussing. So, this is uh, the integer quantum Hall effect. This is related with electrons in a two-dimensional gas. You apply a very strong magnetic field and you observe this type of plateaus. And this is for I equals 2. Usually we go to I equals 2 because for I equals 1 it's hard to have some magnetic field. And exactly this type of physics happens also in our system. But uh, Hofstadter said, in order to do this type of physics in uh, solid state uh, settings, you have to have fields of 10 to the 5 Tesla. Nowadays, the world record of Tesla is 100. So we need three orders of magnitude to study this type of uh, physics of Hofstadter. But already he proposed, if you want to do this experiment, you can create a synthetic two-dimensional lattice. And this is exactly uh, what we have done. We created a synthetic two-dimensional lattice where we put atoms and we study this. These are the big people, Hofstadter, Harper and Piles. And maybe you know the Aharonov bomb effect. So in order to study at the quantum level uh, electromagnetic fields, you, it's maybe better to use uh, vector and scalar potentials because they go deeper than the magnetic and electric field. And they can explain phenomena such as this, where you do not have any magnetic field in the trajectories that the electrons are falling, but the vector potential can change the wave function and pretty much have interference. And we have created an artificial system with atoms now. We can create similar phases. This is a type, this would be a small, a small fit, where we create a very strong synthetic magnetic field. And just to give you a sense, all the previous proposals in the world, or the previous realizations, have created in the order of like 10 vortices, like this is the course of vortex, in 10 to the 5 atoms, for example. But what that means, that our proposal that can create now one vortex per atom, is almost 3 to 4 orders of magnitude higher magnetic fields. And this is why our work has kind of received uh, attention from the community. So this is pretty much, this is the Hamiltonian. And uh, we have found a way to pretty much to generate all this butterfly, but we focus on this. Our technique, just by changing the experimental setup uh, trivially, you can explore more. This is the fun structure. Uh, so this is like in solid state physics, you know that if you create a magnetic cell, you can have the unit cell in K space, but in real space you'll have a doubling of the period. And this is exactly what we can do. So you have Dirac cones, this is in the physics of graphene, and like a 
a new modern quantum material, we can create very similar things. We have Dirac cones if you just go here. This is the experiment, what we, have, we propose and what we realized experimentally, pretty much we have atoms, we create an artificial magnetic field with this type of vector potential, and what we see is that we have a synthetic lattice, we have a moving lattice just by interfering beams, and with this we can create uh, this type of resonance. Pretty much these are atoms, when you are off resonance the atoms do not move, but when you go on resonance, the atoms start moving, and this is a manifestation that you have created this system of like cyclotron motion. And uh, this is uh, kind of more technical. This is how we characterize the tunneling. We saw kind of uh, the expansion of atoms, like pretty much shining light, and seeing how much the atoms are moving, and we could control the strength of the tunneling. We pretty much we could make it uh, strong, we could make it zero. And also, we were able to create tunneling, not only quantum tunneling, like as we learn in quantum mechanics, between two double wells, but you can connect these particles to these, or even further away, and this enables you to have uh, uh, coherent physics in much bigger scales. So this is an experiment in, from our lab at MIT immediately after my time, the work we have realized the ground state of this Hamiltonian, and they realized this, the doubling in the period, you see here we have a phase difference between two lattice side, and this expresses itself in this experimental data of the momentum space. And uh, the input of, of our work is other people have used this, are citing our work, and the Haldane model that has been used and has been recognized with the Nobel Prize of 2016 in the official announcement of the Nobel Prize. They say that the realization of the Haldane model in atomic system is pretty much, and uh, it was the only realization of the model in anywhere in physics. So this is our work that has been picked up also by the popular press, physics, physics for all, nature, this is kind of our work, and uh, we don't need this slide. So, I have many other five minutes. So, another work that we have done at MIT is Bragg scattering. I do not know if you are familiar, but this is one technique that has been used in many branches of physics if you want to study quantum materials, or, for example, antiferromagnetic ordering has been observed at MIT in 1949 by using neutron scattering, and then you pretty much see the ordering. Also, even uh, DNA double helix has been observed with Bragg scattering. So this is kind of a ubiquitous technique. So what we have done is we used it to study in uh, quantum degenerate systems how light can probe the ordering of atoms in our setting. But what is also very interesting is you can study time dynamics the same way that I have discussed here. And we must see if atoms are coherent or incoherent. So it's exactly what we did. We have atoms, they are held in an optical lattice. We release them, the atoms tend to expand, repel each other and uh, just expand because the very same way that uh, optical beam expands, and you can measure the scattering rate or the debye waller factor as you will see here. Pretty much the bigger the wave function, the smaller the debye waller factor or the smaller the scattering rate. And this is what will happen if you are in condensed matter physics where temperature makes the wave packet stronger. But in cold atoms, and this has its own strength, things are a little bit more a little bit different. This is the Talbo effect that uh, we possibly know. We sign a laser beam or light. Talbo did not have laser. It passes through a periodic grading and it has a tendency to revive and reappear. And this is exactly what we have seen for a three-dimensional Talbo system. 
in this our world. You see that we have light, atoms are expanding, we have this kind of uh, partial revivals, and whenever we have this uh, change of a quantum, from a quantum phase, we do not have any more coherent matter waves, but we go to a molten slate or we go to atoms that they have an um, undefined phase, and this was a way to probe this system. Pretty much with black scatter, we cannot only probe ordering, but we can probe the quantum phase. And this type of work has been used in this uh, Nature paper to study for the first time kind of some form of uh, correlations to see three-dimensional uh, antiferromagnetism. And uh, this is a theoretical work that was involved in uh, the last uh, couple of slides. So, as I said, we have the post hubbard model, but we can have a multi-spin systems, such as this, we can have quantum tunneling for spin up and spin down. And we have worked in, a, we have exploited one mapping between these two. <coughs> for example, when you have two spins up, the magnetization can be positive. When the spins are opposite, the total magnetization is zero, and then you can go from the two-component Bosch-Hubbard model to a Heisenberg Hamiltonian, and then you can study the exchange physics. And uh, this, uh, we propose the way to adiabatically go from a state of very order, like we know with high precision or with very, in very low entropy, the number of atoms, and then we adiabatically change the system and we create the XY ferromagnet. This is kind of um, the motivation for this is to start starting quantum magnetism in atomic systems. And this is kind of at the frontier of the field. This is exactly what we see. We can start this. So we have kind of um, experimental efforts to realize this also in the lab. And you can adiabatically create uh, these type of systems where you can go from exponentially decay correlations to algebraically decaying. And this is kind of the ground state. And this is kind of what the specific ramps that we are proposing and they are realistic in the labs. And we see that kind of the fidelity or the correlations can be preserved with our ramps. So this is a way of doing adiabatic cooling to magnetic order. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and have any questions. diffraction of uh, matter waves has been realized even before going to extremely cold samples just by changing the job like from David Pritchard. Yeah. So this is a very well established method and now with cold atoms you can do you can repeat this experiment. In fact in order to calibrate our optical lattices we do uh, capita uh, diffraction. And what is also nowadays possible is that you can create artificial um, matter configuration. You can create a, a quantum wire. You can create a path that the atoms can move in special potentials. But uh, as far as I remember in the case of which the deflection angles were so small that you could not somehow distinguish the two beams. 
So, exactly. So that, that, That's the information which probably several details about. So, when you have atoms that are going far away, the difference is like 2 h bar k or 4 h okay. bar k. Okay. If the atoms are very hot, they will start expanding together uh -huh. with deflecting. And this is what you earn by going to cold atoms. <laughs> there is no more uh, big wave packets. And now you can see very nicely many, many orders. So this is we kind of, I would say nowadays, is standard and is used to calibrate. Uh, they, I guess if you go a little bit further from the diffraction pattern, then these beams are not any more distinguished. So maybe so if you increase of the temperature. Yeah. So uh, if uh, in the David Pritchard experiments or in the old uh, thermal gas experiment, you have to go far away because you know linear the atoms will go far away, but they expand, so you end up hitting the noise level. So you have to do this experiment before they deflect too much. But now it is uh, uh, standard. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this fascinating presentation. I found it very extremely interesting. Uh, there, I had several questions, technical maybe, uh, throughout your presentation. I didn't want to interrupt you, but just some uh, from curiosity, I want to see where you you developed an objective to do imaging of atoms. I, uh, I remember the work that you've done in MIT, I suppose. Uh, can you go back to this uh, sure. slide? We have some green fluorescent. Uh, this. Yeah, so right. this work is in Amsterdam, but this picture is from, from Harvard. Harvard. Harvard, Harvard. Harvard yeah. mm -hmm. All right. So uh, the, uh, what you actually imagine there? What, what, they, uh, what is this green pattern? It is fluorescent, fluorescent slide, right? Okay, good. So you give me the opportunity to describe this technique. So usually the way that uh, people do it, well, it is the most common technique, is to do fluorescence imaging of trapped atoms. So you put one atom, <coughs> you shine light, pretty much the same light that is used to cool, and this absorbs and re-emits. So you have kind of fluorescence from the atomic transition. And then you have an objective and you collect this light and you do pretty much fluorescence imaging of individual atoms. And what is so this has been done already for 20 years, but what is harder is to have the atom very uh, close to each other and at the same time to be far. Because if you are very close, you can not put many laser beams. The things are a little bit technically more challenging. And because I see that these uh, arrows they are indicating that this is 640 nanometers. Okay, that is big dimension. So, when you claim that you are doing atom imaging. Okay, so, so you, uh, how to say, so what you do is, what is important for us is not to see the nature of atom in, uh, to image like an angstrom. We don't do like STM or SCM method. What we want to know is where is the atom and if it is a second atom there. But if so, pretty much you can this do. This is exactly my question because if you have this type of uh, spatial so this is limited power, then how is it possible to see whether you have a second atom there? Oh, oh nice. <laughs> so the way that the, this method works. So first of all, when people calibrate how many atoms they have in all the experiments of atomic physics, is you know the fluorescence rate. And from the number of photos that you are collecting, you can go back. But there is another mechanism, more of atomic physics, that can tell you this. Whenever you shine light in this type of experiment, whenever you have two atoms, they will be lost. In fact, what is the ambiguity here? So you do like parity measurement. So when you have here, when it is black, it could also be two atoms yeah. because they are lost. They but this, yes, but they do kind of they collide and they go away because of like light induced transitions. But because you know the statistics, how many atoms? So it's very easy to say that I will have ten or two. This you can distinguish easily.
So you do statistics and they make a histogram. What will be zero, one, two? So there are a little bit more technical points. So okay, now this what you're saying is that you can eventually measure intensity figures, for instance, and from the intensity you can come back and say, oh, this is high intensity hotspot here, that means many apples. Yeah, so you can say with this picture, if you just see it without any assumptions, if you have even or odd number. But if you have four or six or eight atoms, they do not live in our system easily. For example, the, the number of doublons of two atoms is maybe less than 0.1%. So it is uh, pretty much you create a very nice state. And what you want to address is one individual atoms. Okay. And then what is the, par the particular importance of the objective that you design? Because uh, the, can you, can you, can we see the next slide? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so this is, uh, in some sense, uh, yes, it is, I see the optics are more or less standard. standard. Yes, so, exactly. So this is not a breakthrough in optics, it's uh, developing uh, tools to do this, what is not available commercially easily or cheaply, and this is a homemade objective that we designed that you can have from here, from here to here, 20 millimeters, and when you have all circles. So this is not just, you cannot just go and buy this from Tholab, so, so you have to develop. But uh, because people- Because of the long body distance. Yes, 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 yes. And this, I mean, having a 600 nanometer for 461 nanometer light is not, and breaking any record, is not that we do nanometer. It's just a good, solid, uh, conventional microscope objective for our goal. So you have very, very narrow depth of focus, for instance. Yes. Relative, so if you have... Is the numerical average of this? 0.43. Okay. So quite uh, moderate, not... Yeah, it is, it's okay. For the, it's time, time to empty. Uh, I do not know. I, yeah, don't, I don't remember the... the right, and so you use this, this objective lens to, to do imaging of the atoms. Yes, yes. So now, the way that we do, this is this stuff we bought from a, a spin-off of ETH, a nano holes, like 200 nanometer nano holes, we pass light, and then this is a point spread function by using a nano holes. So it's a conventional objective, but for a specific goal, and uh, it's not so common to have 20 millimeters. Uh, so you use these nanoholes for, for achieving confinement of atoms, right? Of light. Of light. So light passes through, and then you can characterize the point spread function. Because this is the optics characterization of this, and only this is uh, the atomic physics. Here yeah. this is. You see atoms. I'm not sure that whether I can understand uh, what we when you say you are measuring the point spread fraction from the light passing through the nanoholes. What is the meaning? I will tell you. So point spread fraction is roughly the, is the following. You know better than me. <laughs> is uh, what to explain for the discussion. Yes. Uh, so it's the image that you create when from a, a point from a point source so the 200 nanometer nano hole approximates relatively well a point source ideally you want to pass light from five nanometers so one nanometer so then you should expand and see it so this but is if just your lens if you use sorry for the repeating questions i'm fixing no no questions. i'm very interested for that that's what i'm asking and my pleasure. Yeah, the, the, the thing is that what you're saying that you have a nano, nano cube, nano cube. Nano hole. Nano hole, nano, from a nano cube. And you measure the point for fraction using the, your objective, right? Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. So the problem is that your objective cannot manage to go in terms of, uh, you know, resolution. Uh, the best case will go 300 nanometers. Yes, yes, exactly. Best yes, case. Yes, yes. Right. So, uh, so you are limited by the nanopore. That uh, uh, has a, a, a resolution, and here a resolution that it is 
much worse than the spatial feature that we try to measure the point surprise. Correct. So if how do you do this? You might, you, you, it's impossible, to my view, to measure point spread function with a system that has a worse point spread function. So what we want to Just to show one photo. It's problem. only the, the optics part of the thing, because I don't see where, where are the matter waves. So this is just an object, this is uh, an optics uh, project. No, it's just light optics. Yeah. 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 Oh, this is not, uh, no, it's no, just no, a tool. Not yet, it's matter waves. Uh, no, so it's a technical question. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm apolo so, apologizing for no, no. the discussion to that so, level, but it, I'm, I'm just curious. Let's make more concrete. So these are the nano holes. Okay. If the, we have used Oslo, to find the resolution. So we know that the resolution is in the order of 600 nanometers. That means that if we had nano holes, micro holes of one micrometer, it is uh, useless. But if the nano holes are already three times smaller than the resolution that we have predicted, you have maybe a small uh, artifact. So we don't have any limitation. The best would be to have nano holes of two nanometers, much, much smaller. But for our purpose, or the accuracy that we want to characterize things, maybe 5%, 10%, still, uh, this that is. I don't, I don't remember now to tell you the number, because this introduces an artifact that may, makes the observed point spread function a little bit bigger. But we do not go to the very details of yeah. this. I saw that you had a notice about Raman. Uh, this is something that uh, I didn't uh, find some time to digest. It, it, uh, uh, can you elaborate a little bit? The on Raman or the Brahman? The Raman. Okay. This stuff, right? Yes. So let me just have the time to say it again. So, to explain a little bit, uh, so what, uh, I now have the time to say this, what is the meaning of these operators? You have one atom in position M, here. So, and when it moves in position M plus one, just moves one lap side, when the atom goes from here to here, it is a wave. So it can get a phase. This phase, is created here. And we know that E to the I K R is a the K R is a phase. So pretty much whenever you have momentum K, you can uh, there is no difference, it's a phase. It's a phase. So exactly what happens here. So now so whenever we have phase it's a momentum. So what this is what happens here. We want to introduce this type of phases for our mapping. And in order to achieve this mapping, uh, let me, uh, okay. uh, what I was explaining the Hamiltonian, uh, so here, we agree that phase is momentum, because e to the eight kr. Sure, sure. So this is what happens here. So you have two beams, two Raman beams, with slightly different frequencies, and this creates a moving potential, because when you have the same frequency is standing. When the frequency is slightly different, it's so moving. Like so this speed. is the momentum transfer. So you don't ha only have a velocity, but you have a specific, because it's a vector addition or subtraction. So these two vectors is a momentum kick, or if you just want to take the rapid phase, is an interference yes. thing. This is, you go from this type of more physical, kinetic energy, periodic potential, a tilt and this, and then you can do the little bit of math that was part of our work to have these phases. So they are related. So this is the Raman. But uh, if you, if I said Raman, maybe it's not. Uh, maybe it can be a bit confusing. Usually Raman is when you change the spin. But maybe it's better to say we say in the paper laser assisted or Bragg. So the momentum changes, but the spin doesn't change. So maybe I, by mistake I use the word Raman, but it's a Bragg uh, process. Right. Right. Uh, 
And the final one uh, is that the, I saw uh, about your magnetometer. Uh, yes, the, my conceptual yeah, subject. Yes, the, uh, uh, I, I noticed that there is a, uh, you measure this by the frequency shift. Uh, um, yes. The thing is, how you measure this shift? This one, the, yes. the okay. slim one. Yes, yes. <laughs> how can you measure this? The uh, millihertz. In, uh, the small, the little tiny <laughs> change. Okay. So maybe now I'll just take the chance to say what we are doing. What, uh, so this is a concept, almost like a discussion. So yes, yes, I got it. I got it. The thing is, uh, how you, how do you, how do you envision to measure this? Yes, yes. So when we have here, so this is an atomic transition. You have an atom. You shine light. You can scan the light by changing a uh, anisotropic modulator. Okay. So this, if this is 10 megahertz, like this, you can change a little bit the magnetic field. And you, instead of having zero transmission, you can go here mm -hmm. and have 50%. So I'm just making the simplest case. Yes. So this yeah. would be, let's say, 5, 3 megahertz. And 3 megahertz is very easy to scan. So now, if you have a transition that is like this, meaning to go from here to here, it is a much smaller field. I just now, because from here to here it corresponds to 5 Gauss. If you had something that was so tiny, this will correspond to milli Gauss or much smaller. And usually, changing, find, uh, characterizing maybe to up to 1 hertz is uh, trivial. Maybe you can go to 0.1 hertz. Or how, now we can do this experiment. But if you go to 1 milli hertz, as I'm promising, now the best laser in the world is maybe 25 milli hertz broad. So we don't have any uh, the lasers to do this. So as long as we have good lasers, we can go. So now we are okay, limited now by I the laser. Okay. I, 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 but the physical system permits to... Of course, there are many yeah. mechanisms. This is very... I have not ex examined all the statistics, yes. all the effects. It's just the... But the idea that we have an ultra narrow as we have, and it is magnetic, it can be in principle, because the video, like this, they have done some term to set test some already. Yes. Imagine now if you have a hertz transition, let's say not really hertz, hertz.